All right, guys, today's topic is humans in the biosphere. So what are your roles in our ecosystem? This is what Maine Beach Laguna looked in the 1900s. And I'm sure you've been down to Laguna recently. This is the road right here that comes in from the canyon. And then about right here is the lighthouse. Look how different this beach looks in just 120 years. So we have obviously had an impact in our ecosystem, in the biosphere. Um, the animals that are living in downtown Laguna Beach are much different today than they were 120 years ago. When we talk about the resources that humans are going to go after, we've got renewable resources and non-renewable resources. So renewable resources can regenerate, can regrow if it is alive and replenish if it's a biochemical cycle. So we're gonna regenerate if it's an animal, like let's say we're gonna go out and hunt bunnies, those can regenerate. It can replenish if it's a biochemical cycle. When we talk about replenishing, we can replenish our aquifers and get more water. We can replenish the energy that we get from the wind the next time there's a windstorm. So when we talk about renewable resources, we're talking about plants, solar energy, wind, animals for food, and water for drinking. Non-renewable resources is a resource that can't be replenished naturally. These are things that took millions of years to develop and once we use them we're not going to get another source of them. So when we talk about non-renewable we talk about coal and oil and natural gas. There are fossil fuels because they are the remnants of fossils. We have human impacts and realize that humans have impacted their environment from the time they evolved. So once we became humans, we started impacting our environment. But initially our impact wasn't any worse than a bear, right? So we'd go out and we'd hunt and we'd gather and we'd kill things. Um, we tended to be nomadic in the beginning. Um, so our waste wasn't accumulating. As we got more and more into human history, our impact has increased. Once we settled down into one area instead of being nomadic, our impact increased. So the impact increased substantially during the Industrial Revolution. That's when we really started to see a huge human impact. And as our advancement of technology increases, so does our impact on the environment. Global human activity uses as much energy and transports almost as much matter as everything else combined on Earth. So kind of a gnarly statement there. So the first humans were hunters and gatherers. They hunted for meat and fish. They gathered nuts and veggies. They affected their environment no more than any other top predator. As our technology increased, so did our ability to kill organisms faster and therefore our impact increased. So as we went from using a rock that was turned into a spear or a knife to using a bow and arrow, we could now be more efficient. And the more efficient we were at killing things, the more our impact increased. Around 11,000 years ago, agricultural began and farming is defined or agriculture is defined as growing plants and animals for human consumption. In the 1800s and 1900s, farmers began using technology to increase their harvest. So all of a sudden we had machines that could allow us to harvest more land more efficiently and faster. Um, we started using fossil fuels in our farming instead of using an ox. Um, we had chemical fertilizers. So we could take land that was marginal, that wasn't great for farming, and we could put it into production. The Green Revolution is the widespread use of technology to increase the world's food supply, and it occurred in the middle of the 20th century. It doubled our food production, which is awesome because human population has skyrocketed, and we needed food to feed this population, and the Green Revolution allowed us to do that. Land resources are all of the things that we need that we're getting from the land, including the space for you to live and to work and the soil in which we're growing our crops. If the crops are rotated, if we are not planting corn in the same place month after month after month, the soil will replenish the nutrients it needs and it will be a renewable resource. But with the Green Revolution, we tended to turn soil into a non-renewable resource. We allowed it to be over farmed 
We allowed our plants and our farming techniques to strip it of nutrients, and it was eroded by wind and water. Um, when you drive through farmland, there's often trees up. Those are gonna help as wind breaks and try and prevent the erosion of the soil. Um, so when you look at this picture here, all of these farmlands are kind of bordered by trees. Where are the downsides in agriculture? The first is that we led to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. So when you study American history, right before the stock market crash, we basically took our Midwest and we turned it into one giant dust sandstorm. And all of that soil blew off the fields. That took with it the nutrients that we needed to grow crops. With an increase in plants, we have an increase in insects. And if we have an increase in insects, we have an increase in pesticides. Those pesticides don't just target the things that are eating our crops. They also will target any other insect, which then leads to extinction of things that we really do like. And the use of river water for irrigation has diminished the natural water supply. So as I've dammed rivers um, to use it for my farm, then downstream that natural habitat doesn't have the water that it needs. Genetically engineering of plants and insects has led to things like killer bees. So in South America, we took a honeybee with an Africanized bee to try and make this awesome bee that would produce lots of honey for us. And what we did was get a bee that was very, very aggressive. And then it escaped the scientific um, realm and is now terrorizing people all over South America and the Southwestern United States. So this is like the Dust Bowl. Imagine that coming at you. Um, and here are our killer bees. Forest resources are the wood that, from the forest that's used for paper products, for fuel, for furniture. The forests provide a habitat for many organisms and they're also a source of oxygen. Old growth forests are those forests that have never been logged. And we do still have some old growth forests in the United States. These have the richest ecosystems. They're in that climax community, that last stage of succession. And because they are so mature, they're going to have the highest biodiversity, the highest amount of species. Loss of forest is called deforestation. It leads to the extinction of organisms because if the trees aren't there, the animals can't live there anymore. Um, the roots of the trees hold the soil. So if we get rid of the trees, then we have erosion and just damage the soil in general. Sustainable forestry doesn't cut every tree and every tree they take one is planted in its place, it tries to maintain the diversity of the forest. This is an example of an old growth forest. These are the sequoias up in Kings Canyon in the central coast. Obviously my kids were a lot younger then. Two of those have already graduated from high school and are in college. Um, this is the General Sherman stump. This was actually a tree that was taken and shipped to Washington for the national Christmas tree but look how huge this tree must have been if you have to use stairs to get up onto the stump. And that's an example of my son standing on it when he was very little. This is forestry. Um, if you look, this is clear cutting where they take every single tree. They do that because it's economical, right? They can bring in the large equipment in order to haul those trees out. Sustainable, like I said, is a method of using the resource that allows the renewable resources time to replenish. So we're not taking every tree, we're taking a small select, it still is a forest. If we're talking about fisheries, we're taking just the old mature fish that have already reproduced once. And so there's time for those organisms to replenish, to keep their populations high. It limits the impact of human activity on an environment, but the downfall is it is more expensive. And so you have to choose to vote with your pocketbook. Do you find it important enough to maintain that forest that you're gonna pay a little bit more for wood or paper that is sustainably harvested? Urban development, people began to move to urban areas during the industrial revolution. So people moved off of the farms into the cities. And once they moved into the cities, then we had big factory farming come in that used huge machinery to supply food to the cities for the people that are living there. All of these cities were fueled by fossil fuels, coal in the beginning, oil and natural gas now. The factories and masses of people discarded their waste into the land and water. 
and we have urban sprawl where the suburbs surrounding the cities begin to fill with people needed to run the factories. We are actually a suburban area of Los Angeles and San Diego, which means that we have people who work, who live in this area that work both in LA and in San Diego. Just examples of urban sprawl. Um, as we have urban sprawl, we increase transportation needs because you have to commute to LA or San Diego. And so we increase our use of fossil fuels and our pollution from those vehicles. Fishery resources, most of the world is gonna get their protein from fish and taking fish faster than it can reproduce is called overfishing. This leads to the extinction of species. And between 1950 and 1990, the fish catch increased by 70 million fish brought in. The fish are now raised on farms to try and alleviate the pressure on the natural environment. Um, these fish are then eaten or reintroduced in order to reproduce. In the United States, we also have very strict limits on the catch of fish and other seafood to hopefully maintain the populations. Here is an example of fish farming. Um, that's what they're doing in the pool there with the net and other types of fisheries. This is kind of cool. So we've dammed a lot of rivers for hydroelectricity. This is up in Oregon on the Columbia River. And this is the dam that we are standing on. The fish actually come in from the river and jump up here and go through a funnel where they can cross over to the dam to the other side. So this is them kind of crossing over the top of the dam. Biodiversity, this term refers to the overall variety of organisms in an ecosystem. And within each species, there's genetic diversity, which means in each species, not every organism looks the same. This allows a species to adapt to environmental changes and to evolve. And scientists have identified 1.5 million different species. There are millions out there that are still to be discovered. Every year, there's a symposium where we talk about new things that have been discovered. And there are still mammals, mammals, guys, that are being discovered. It's an estimated five species will go extinct every a minute as we destroy their habitats. This diversity allows us to get the nutrients, supplies, and inventions that we need to live. Um, there's a statement that we think the cure to cancer is in the rainforest and we just haven't found it yet. Here's a look at those species that we currently have identified. So when you look here, um, mollusks are this color, so that's all of your seafood with a shell. Annelida are segmented worms. There's a lot of them, right? So mammals, we only have about 4,000 identified mammals compared to some of this other stuff. So what's a threat to biodiversity? The first one's habitat alteration. When we build our cities and our farms, we destroy the habitats of animals that live there. Um, the city of Irvine is having a huge coyote problem because they have built in the coyote's habitat. And those coyotes still need a place to live. They still need food. And when they get desperate enough, then they start eating your cats and dogs and small children. Fragmentation of wild space is going to cut off the food mates. We think we're doing such a great job. We leave these parks out there. But the parks are all fragmented. And in order for an animal to get from one park to another, they have to cross through housing tracks. There is a huge demand for wildlife products. Um, the hunting of animals for their fur, blubber, tusks have pushed a lot of animals to the brink of extinction. And animals that are considered endangered are now protected by laws, both international laws and laws of individual countries. An introduced species refers to an organism that's transported into an area through human activity. It didn't used to live there, and when it gets there, it often becomes invasive. It often rules the roost because it doesn't have any predators. Nothing knows that it tastes good and things don't know to be afraid of it. Um, a big example of this is when we bring snakes to different islands. Um, this is Guam. Guam says that there's about 200 snakes per square mile. So think about our campus here at Mission Viejo, we're about a square mile. There would be 200 snakes here. Um, this is a zebra mussel, so if anyone has water sports, boats, jet skis, this is an invasive species that's in almost all of our freshwater environments right now, and it clogs up the intakes of motors of boats and turbines and all of that. Many efforts to conserve um, biodiversity are aimed at preventing an individual species from going extinct. Often the cute and fuzzy ones get the attention. 
Um, we are going to do this through laws against hunting, um, bringing them into zoos and doing artificial insemination and reproduction, and then just preserving their habitat. Some countries are attempting to preserve habitat. Um, the bad news is that if they don't preserve a huge piece of habitat, it creates an island of biodiversity, um, and all of a sudden you start having inbreeding and genetic issues in those animals. That's it. We have now covered ecology and your test will be one of the next things you guys do.